Good evening to everyone from the Munich City Library. My name is Judith Stumpner. I'm in charge of the library's program work, and I'm happy to welcome you here this evening. The conversation we host tonight is the first conversation in a new series that the Munich City Library is organizing as part of its work focus, Democracy. It is done so in cooperation with the Association Mittelpunkt Europa, the Institute for German Culture and History of Southeast Europe at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, and the Adelbert Stifter Association. In the coming month, we want to look east and seek conversations about literature and democracy between Prague and Kiev, between Warsaw and Sofia. The focus of these talks is on what still divides the two parts of Europe and what connects them. We'll talk about the new perspectives that open up when we look at the discourses about the united Europe in the east and talk about how Central and Eastern European literature reflects on them. We will primarily invite authors. For example, on July 13, there will be a conversation with the Belarusian author Viktor Martinovich. Authors from Czech Republic, Ukraine and Hungary will follow. But representatives of other disciplines are also represented, represented in the series. Said so, I can warmly welcome our guests tonight. Marie Janine Kalik, Professor for History of Eastern and Southeastern Europe at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, a well renowned expert on the history of the Balkans, who in the 90s worked as a political advisor to the special coordinator of the Stability Pact for Southeast Europe in Brussels, as well as the United Nations Protection Force headquarters in Zagreb. And Ivan Krastev, political scientist and political advisor. He's chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Since 2015, he has been writing regularly for the international edition of the New York Times. At the beginning of our series of talks, this evening shall deal with the reasons for the current political crisis in Central Eastern Europe, the misunderstanding that exists between East and West, and the different interests concerning the future of Europe. We will first hear a keynote speech by Ivan Krastev, followed by a statement by Marie Janine Kalik. The two then enter into a conversation. If you want to contribute or raise questions, you can do so via the chat function on YouTube. We will include the questions in the conversation during the course of the evening. Before we start, I'd like to thank our partners who, with their ideas and support, make this new series Fahrt Richtung Ost possible, namely Klaus Planck, Enneke Dutch, and Susanna Jürgens. And I do also thank my colleague Sabine Hahn and the team of the Gasteig who will accompany us through the evening. Now, I wish all of us an interesting evening and hand over the word to Marie Janine Kalik. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and introduction. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here to start a series of lectures and discussions. And I'm particularly glad to welcome Ivan Krastev, who is in Vienna today. I have known Ivan and his writings for many years, and I'm uh, really a fan of his, his writing as so many others. So, Ivan, I would invite you immediately to start with your input, and then I suggest we enter a discussion. I would not um, comment at length what you're saying, but rather try to have a more um, way of dialogue. So, please, Ivan. ...that we have been having over uh, the years. So, what I'm planning to do is just in the beginning, in 15, 20 minutes, several arguments which much more can frame our conversations than basically having something that uh, sounds like a lecture. And because the problem of East versus West of Europe is not a new one, just to remind you that it was always there, I'll start with an old Central European joke. And the joke is about two trains which at the end of the 19th century were traveling, one from Moscow 
Moscow for people. And at one and the same time, both entered the Warsaw railway station, and both trains has the feeling that they have arrived. Uh, and I'm saying this because the idea of uh, political identity of uh, Central Europe was very much contested, even a very recent opinion poll being done by Globsec Institute uh, demonstrated that all countries in the region being asked where do you feel in the east or in the west or in the middle, they're going to put themselves in the middle. But while we know that east-west divide is quite important in Europe, my first argument is going to be that Europe consists of different divides. And in some way it's quite important. Yeah, sorry for this. I was just saying that uh, the different divides that are shaping uh, uh, European Union and during the global financial crisis, it was the south north divide that was very central. There was much more difference on economic policies. Then came the migration crisis and then the east-west divide came at the top of the political agenda. But saying this in political terms, the biggest divide that you can see in Europe, if you see voting preferences, and if you see basically survey of values, strangely enough is not the divide between East and West, but this is the divide between the big urban centers in Europe and uh, the rural areas and the countryside. If you're going to see how Warsaw or Budapest or Bratislava vote, what is the answers to all of the major issues that you have, you're going to be surprised that they behave as if being part of the West. And if you're going to see certain areas within the Western Europe, you're going to see that East is not simply kind of a geographical reality. I'm saying this because from this point of view, the second is that the central Europe, the East, is also much more diverse than the common communist past is going to suggest. For example, Poland is still one of the most uh, religious societies in the European Union, while at the same time the most agnostic society in the European Union is the Czech Republic. Uh, so my first question is what we are talking about in political terms about East-West divide that we are talking uh, that we are discussing these days. And my argument is that in a certain way what is at the center of the discussion is the emergence of the political regimes in Hungary and Poland, their view to the European Union and trying to understand not simply what they want, but also why the voters in Central and Eastern Europe is much more ready to put in power uh, illiberal governments that are going very much to contest uh, the, uh, the European Union. Uh, and uh, to make our conversation kind of much more uh, uh, simple than the situation is, there was a moment, particularly when for the first time, basically, Mr. Orban came to power and there started to be talks after 2010 about the problems of uh, uh, violation of the media rights, about pressure on the judiciaries. All these talks, were, uh, all these problems have been very much discussed as the crisis of democratization. What we know is that all over Europe, we have not simply the crisis of democratization, but the crisis of democracy. And the idea of the backsliding, the fact that simply Central and East Europeans are going back to their bad practices, probably explains part, but they don't explain much of the situation in the way we see it. Uh, and uh, one of the important ways where East and West, in my view, really differ uh, and this was very central for the book that we have been writing with Stephen Holmes, The Light That Failed, was that after the end of the Cold War, the West was the model for the East. East Europeans, we basically wanted to be part of the West. We always believed that culturally we belong to the West. This was particularly strong in the Central Europe, less in places like Bulgaria and Romania. Uh, so, at certain point, the whole story of these 30 years is the story of migration of the East to the West of Europe, the migration of the countries of the former communist bloc to the European Union. And this migration took two different forms. It was an individual migration, many of us ended up living in places like Vienna or Munich, but it was also the migration of our countries, joining European Union, basically adopting uh, European legislation, European norms. So, one of the surprises of uh, the, the, the emergence of the political regimes like the ones in Poland and Hungary was that 
suddenly these governments, while uh, were very critical to the European Union and particularly very critical to the way that East should imitate the West. We do not want to be imitators anymore, was one of the major arguments that can be heard uh, uh, from uh, the political leaders, but also intellectual figures close uh, uh, to the current governments in Poland and country. And this, uh, uh, in my view, is quite important. And of course, it has, it has a different dimensions. Uh, but in order to make the difference between East and West, in my view, better understandable. I'll try to follow a logic which is different from the one that compares institutions and basically adopts uh, simply the language of the rule of law and try to see everything as an institutional past dependency. And start with something that I find very important for the formation of this type of regimes and basically what partly explains uh, the popular support that they have. incredible demographic changes that are coming and happening in the East European societies for a long period, by the way, it started in the 1970s. Uh, what we are seeing, and this is the three uh, points that I want to make before going to discussion. One is, if you go back to the ethnic maps of Europe at the beginning of the 20th century, you're going to see two Europes there. One was very much culturally diverse, religiously diverse, ethnically diverse, and this was Central Europe, the Habsburg lands. The other Europe was ethnically much more homogeneous, and this was Germany, it was France, it was Scandinavian countries. And then you have the 20th century in which many things happened. People have been traveling, states have been traveling. The well-known story of a Macedonian peasant who never left his village Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why it is like this. It's getting into probably there, Yeah, probably there is internet connection. I don't know. We were with a Macedonian peasant who never yeah. left so his Mas country. <laughs> yeah, he never left his country. He was born in the year 1900. Imagine that he lived for 100 years. And without leaving his village for a single day, he happened to be a subject or a citizen of five different countries. So in the 20th century, states have been traveling. People have been traveling too. And I'm saying this because at the end of the 20th century, you have on the ethnic maps of Europe, two Europes again. One is very much culturally, ethnically, religiously diverse. And this time, this is Western Europe. These are countries like Germany, like Austria, like France. 40% of the population of Vienna today are foreigners. The majority of uh, the kids in Austrian schools in the early years do not have German as a first language. And on the other side, at the end of the Cold War, you have Central Europe, which was extremely ethnically homogeneous. More than 95% of the population of Poland were Poles in 1989 compared to one third of uh, the population of Poland uh, being different minorities, Jews, uh, Germans, Ukrainians uh, in year 1939. So ethnic homogenization is one very important factor of what happened in Eastern Europe uh, at, uh, during the 20th century. And this created a situation in which ethnic homogeneity was very much perceived as the precondition not simply for the existence of the nation states, but also very much pre-existence for functioning democracy. So in a situation in which Europe is changing incredibly and Eastern Europe basically is dramatically shrinking because of a low birth rates, very much similar to the one that you have mostly in the Western Europe, but also aging population and the major out migration coming of the countries as a result of the opening of the borders. This created incredible demographic fears. And here is my major argument. In order to understand the major political clashes in Europe, it is not so much interested to try to see how people elect their governments, but try to understand that uh, in the well-known reverse that you know from the Brechtian poem of 1983, it is interesting to see how governments elect their people. 
in a certain way, it's interesting to see what kind of people governments are going to elect when they're designing citizenship roles, when they're designing electoral roles. And here you're going to see the major difference between at least what you see in Hungary and Poland on one side and what you're seeing in places like Germany or France. And the story is that in the case of Eastern Europe, the idea is that state belongs to a certain ethnic group. One of the major clash that we have in Europe today is between the historically constructed concept of the nation state, where you assume the existence of a permanent majorities and permanent minorities, and the idea of the democratic idea of a majority where a majority is changing every four years. So suddenly there is a prospect that democratic majorities can change ethnocultural majorities. And how to keep the ethnic nature of the body politics while Central and Eastern Europe is opening its markets particularly labor market, it's quite clear that there are going to be more and more foreigners that are going to come to our countries. This is the major story, what you see. Strangely enough, what Central and Eastern Europe is doing today is not so different than Germany was doing in the 1970s. There are two million foreigners working in Poland these days, most of them Ukrainians, predominantly Ukrainians, but also including Pakistani, Filipinos. But there is no interest to make these people Polish citizens. They are treated as a guest workers. And this idea that opening of the society, opening of the market, should not result in the changing of the ethnic nature of the body politics, this is the liberal project of what kind of people we want to elect. And on the other side, basically, you have countries like Germany and others, which very much changed their citizenship policies, and which basically decided that the only way to integrate their society is basically offering a citizenship for people that have been living long enough, regardless of their ethnic origin. And I do believe this is the clash that we are seeing as the clash between East and West these days. Of course, there are many other differences. There are different ways, uh, for example, the climate crisis is perceived. There are different uh, ways that certain type of uh, uh, major rights are perceived. Uh, but if you are not going to understand the centrality of the demographic fears, you are never going to understand why people like Mr. Orban or the Polish government or the Polish Catholic Church are so much trying to exploit, for example, attack on the gay and lesbian community uh, in order to, uh, to get votes and to stay in power. The idea that our nations are shrinking, that tomorrow there are not going to be enough Poles or Hungarians, makes every type of an alternative sexual behavior as if as a being a national betrayal. And this explains this way to try to weaponize uh, this type of uh, cultural fears uh, for the governments to stay in power. So this is where basically I start trying to put it uh, uh, and try to uh, frame the possible discussion that we can have. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan, for a very concise and thought-provoking intervention. Let me start directly with your key argument. I found it very um, interesting that you started by saying that there are different divides within Europe, um, there are bigger divides uh, than the East-West divide between metropoles and uh, the countryside, between north and south, and so on. But then you ended up with a key argument how different um, the East was as compared to the West when it comes to a liberalism and uh, democratization, or as you would say, a, a backlash in the, de the democracy project which we see in different countries in the East. Now, your argument is rather um, related to psychology. I understand you uh, refer to a kind of collective inferiority complex and anxieties um, in the East by many that, uh, you know, liberalism would mean integrating foreigners and this would lead to a loss of identity and more diversity and so on. 
in one of your writings, you evo evoked Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, a monster that uh, turned against his inventor out of frustration and rejection, um, out of fear not being accepted. And this is a, a, a kind of metaphor, or you use it as a kind of metaphor for describing describing the psychological situation in the East. I just wonder whether this is not a bit simplistic and um, whether this does not evoke too many old stereotypes which are very familiar to the West, which see the East as backward, as nationalist, as the other Europe, the dark side of Europe. Um, what is your take on this divide within eastern societies and within the western societies in a certain way is much more important than the divide between east and west mm -hmm. you're going to find east in every western society and you're going to find west in every eastern society so from this point of view i very much agree with you that it's not about trying to create the collective images uh, that are going to fit to stereotypes even if these stereotypes are not always wrong but for me, the most important was the following. Many people try to explain uh, basically the populist, illiberal shift in Central and Eastern Europe simply in economic terms. And for some of the countries, of course, uh, uh, this economic explanation uh, is works. But if you look at Poland, Poland was the best performing European economy in the last 30 years. But it was not simply about economic growth. Even social inequality declined. In the opinion polls, more than 70% of the polls said that they're satisfied with their lives. Uh, you cannot easily explain the support for law and justice party as the kind of revolt of the losers of the economic transition. You're going to see that, uh, of course, part of the economic explanation probably works, but you have a lot of middle class voters who are not unhappy with their post communist life uh, when they voted for the law and justice parties. And then where, where it comes from, when they decided then to vote for these parties. And in my view, and you're right, uh, psychological explanations are very difficult, first of all, to be proved. And, it's a good story that they're going to be writers speaking from this series after us. So they go much more subtle and probably deeper. Uh, but in my view, it's quite important to see that many of the characteristics that we see and uh, basically are discussed about the uh, behavior uh, of the populist governments in Poland or Hungary are characteristics very typical uh, and well described in the sociological literature of the second generation of, migra of migrants. The first generation comes, it gets integrated, it believes that the fact that they start very much to look like the host country is success. And then suddenly comes the second generation, and this second generation in a way is much more integrated in the society, but it starts to discover loss of identity, start talking about second class citizenship, I have the feeling that you have part of it also in Central Europe. And while the cultural divide between East and West, I very much agree with you, is very artificial, where it goes, how we understand it. If tomorrow France is going to elect uh, uh, Mrs. Le Pen as a president, does it mean that France has become an Eastern country? But at the same time, of course, there is something specific about uh, Eastern Europe, and this specificity comes from the fact that after the end of the Cold War, East was seeing the Western democracies as a model, and part of the crisis is first seeing it as a crisis of the model itself, but also seeing the crisis as the crisis of imitation. So this is where I'll go on this. Okay, then okay. let me push the discussion a bit uh, further. Uh, you mentioned yourself that uh, in, in the West, these illiberal movements are getting stronger. And we have seen this not only in France, but in, in Denmark, in Italy, even in Germany. This kind of thinking is getting even more widespread, ever more widespread. So this somehow corrects a little bit this dichotomy between West, the liberal West, and the liberal East. In particular, if we think that even in these so-called liberal democracies, 
there are actors and forces courageously defending the liberal project, and I wonder where they are in your analysis. Um, we have seen in last years very courageous uh, judges in Poland defend defending the rule of law, in particular as the European Commission referred Poland to the European Court of Justice to protect the independence of the judiciary. We see now in Hungary uh, young people going on the streets uh, to demonstrate and there might even be a co coalition that might send Viktor Orban uh, to opposition in the next um, elections. So where are actually these actors and forces who defend the liberal project in your analysis? It's a great question because when I was trying and when with Stephen we have been working on the book, the questions that we were trying to explain where the support for the populist parties come from. But for sure, the support and the populist voters are not the only voters existing in our countries. And from this point of view, Poland very much resembles the United States. It's a very divided country. There are basically two Polands. Uh, there is uh, the right-wing Poland and the current government, but there is basically the progressive Poland, and this is 50-50. And honestly speaking, I believe that the populist cycle, the liberal cycle in Central and Eastern Europe is coming to an end. And it is coming to an end because some of these governments stayed in power for 10, 12 years, but also because uh, it is not simply that there were heroic people who were defending their values, being in Hungary, being in Poland, but also that this populist government created the anti-populist moment. There was a corruption, particularly in the case of Hungary, then people started to understand what they're losing. So from this point of view, my argument never was that Central and Eastern Europe is going to stay like this always. That's the opposite. I do believe that there are political cycles, but in my view, it was very important to try to explain part of uh, psychological origins of this uh, uh, the, the basically cycle that it comes from. What is interesting and very much interesting for these countries is the following. That it, for me, this is part of the major issue that we're seeing also in other parts of the region. You are seeing it in the Balkans. Part of the out-migration, which was quite important uh, for, uh, uh, for my argument, is that uh, a lot of people left these countries. And many of the people who left the countries were younger people, not necessarily best educated. It was not only the brain drain. Different people have been living, but people who are much more mobile, people who decided to take a risk. So as a result, Central and East European countries were in this very difficult situation in which faced with a government that don't like, you have two options. You can voice in terms of Hirschman, you try to protest, you vote for the opposition, you go in political uh, organizing, or you can decide to leave. And it depends from country to country, uh, but this kind of a easy way to exit, to change your life without basically putting any effort to change your government, became a strange uh, kind of ally of these authoritarian governments. At the same time, these authoritarian governments were afraid of foreigners coming and basically polluting their ethnically clean societies. Uh, at the same time, they were scared because in the last 10 years, uh, as a result of this out-migration, you see a major shortage of labor on the Hungarian market in particular. So how to stop young people leaving your country when you're doing nothing for these people, where basically you're expelling their universities, when you're offering them basically to study to the Chinese universities? And then came this very strong nationalistic rhetoric. And one of my major arguments is that when after the migration crisis, people like uh, Orban and others start demonizing the West, uh, this was not so much because they fear that there are many migrants who want to come to their countries, Syrians or Afghans. This was the fear that their own young people are living. So you should try to demonize the decadence of the West in order these people to convince these people to stay in Hungary or in Poland. But they stayed and they didn't like what they see. And in my view, one of the major problems for all these type of illiberal regimes is the generational clash. You have younger people. Many of them have a different idea about sexual minorities. 
about tolerance, about what is a freedom. Uh, uh, and I do believe that this type of um, regimes are very, very much unable to deal with the demands of this younger generation. And their only major advantage is that this younger generation is a small cohort. These young people do not have the numbers. But this is why these regimes are losing everywhere in the big cities. And talking in political terms, I'm going to repeat the clash between urban and rural areas, what in America they call the density divide, the places where different people are living together in the big cities, where they have a different way of life. And other parts of the country is probably the most important divide. And this is not divide only in Central Europe. This is divide very much in the Western Europe too. Okay, we have a question from the chat, which is somehow fits in what you said. Um, maybe you partially answered this question. Uh, nevertheless, let me uh, put it to you. One of our listeners asks um, whether or not governments would not be aware that the way they are doing politics and that the illiberal project is driving young people away instead of keeping them in the country so that it's actually counterproductive what they are doing. It so sounds like a paradox that, um, you know, all these anxieties are direct <laughs> or are motivated by the fear that too many nationals would, uh, would emigrate at the same time. There is a way of doing politics that exactly pushes the younger and possibly better educated out of the country. Is there no awareness in the governments? Is there no awareness? This is awareness. The problem is that you want young people to come and to work in the country, but you don't want them to vote against your government. And if you, uh, the best way to see how the government thinks about this in political terms is in order to see how differently the Hungarian government regulated how people living outside of the country can vote. If you're Hungarian living in Transylvania, you have the right to vote by post. If you're Hungarian, well, because probably you didn't like very much what you're seeing in your country, you ended up in London, you cannot vote by post. You should go to vote in the embassy. And as you can imagine, this is very much directed at trying to lower the turnout of people who are voting in the major West European cities uh, and countries. I'm saying this because the problem of these governments is that on one level, they try to monopolize power. They're creating a very apocalyptic views of how the world is looking like and what you're doing. And by the way, this government's also quite different because uh, uh, we talk about Poland and Hungary as if being the same regime and there are many policies which are the same. And when it comes to basically discrimination policies or the idea of the sovereignty and the nationalistic discourse, they're very similar on the other side. Polish government is quite clean in corruption terms. Of course, being Bulgarian, I don't have a probably very high uh, threshold of what it means to be clean government or not. But in Hungary, political corruption is part of the very foundation of the regime. Uh, one of the interesting stories, and this is why I do believe that the problem of the younger generation is going to be the critical one, is obsession of right-wing governments in Central and Eastern Europe with universities. The fact that you basically are losing young people. So in a certain way, we know a lot of stories about uh, children revolting against their parents. To a certain extent, if you see this wave of illiberal governments, this is the revolt of the parents against their children. So the decision of the Hungarian government now, on one level, basically, to get the universities out of the control of the government, which means that they created the foundations with the endowments, and they appointed uh, the boards of these foundations to be sure that nevertheless how the next elections are going to take shape. Uh, Fidesz is going to control the educational system. Uh, you have the idea of bringing uh, the Chinese university in Budapest. This is the fear that there is a younger generation that is much more liberal, that is much more open. So this is the story. They know that they're losing these young people, but on the other side, they don't like the way these young people are voting. They don't like the way they talk. They don't like the way they are discussing issues. Okay, thank you. Um, your argument uh, centers on identity and anxieties of uh, losing identity and part of national history and culture. Um, 
to a more diverse uh, society as it exists, uh, presumably in the West. Maybe the, the, f the wish to keep a national identity is not totally illegitimate. S so do you have actually a suggestion how to reconcile the feeling of disregard or uh, lack of respect um, for historical and national traditions um, with the liberal project? So what could one actually do to counter these fears which result in illiberalism? Well, listen, I always believe that uh, one of the major mistakes being done uh, by many of the liberal parties in Central and Eastern Europe is uh, this decision to position themselves uh, simply trying to criminalize any form of, uh, uh, of nationalism because they're a different type of nationalism. There is national pride, which can be extremely constructive and very important. Uh, certain type of a nationalism is very much uh, a part of any uh, uh, political uh, discourse in a democratic state. But here is the interesting difference, and I don't believe this is about Central and Eastern Europe now only. I do believe in Europe in general we are facing this incredibly important moment in which we are redefining what are our national identities, how we're going to rewrite our histories. And Central and Eastern Europe is in a particular position with respect to the West for a very simple reason. And the reason is the following. Most of the Western countries are former empires. And now when basically the discourse of the Cold War is replaced, the discourse very much about decolonization, where suddenly we realize that for people, particularly outside of Europe and the United States, probably decolonization was more important than the Cold War. Here, East and West are slightly in a different position because all the identity of these East European states was very much anti-imperial. Ethnic homogeneity was perceived as being part of the nation state while any type of diversity was associated with empires and not simply associated with empires, but it was perceived as politically dangerous. So in a certain way, in order to adopt to a new situation, uh, uh, your East European society should learn the history of the 20th century. Secondly, unlike in the countries like Germany after the World War II, where nationalism was defeated and basically uh, symbolically uh, also lost, in Central and Eastern Europe in 1989, nationalists and liberals were part of a, a coalition uh, that overthrew communism. Uh, for example, Mr. Kaczynski did not change his views for the last 30 years. He has been politically where he is today. And there was a very strong nationalistic wing of solidarity movement, and these people were quite important uh, for overthrowing uh, uh, the communist regime. So the interesting story then is not why nationalism resurfaced in Central and Eastern Europe. The problem is where it was during the 1990s, where it has been hiding. And my argument is that one of the major reasons for believing that this type of a nationalism uh, is not going to be a major factor uh, in East European politics, particularly after entering the European Union, the major explanation goes on three levels. One was the war in Yugoslavia. Not simply that uh, nationalism basically uh, showed its bloody face during the, this war, but what was not less important, particularly in the case of Serbian nationalism, nationalism was very much associated with the ex-communists. So for somebody like Kaczynski, he cannot associate with this group and this constituency. Uh, while he likes the idea of the ethnic states, he cannot see himself as an ally of somebody like Milosevic. Uh, and I do believe this is quite important because also for the reasons of a geostrategic nature, joining NATO, joining the European Union, we have these 10 years in which nationalism was muted in the region, but it was not at all absent and part of the liberal failure was that we didn't manage to come with a different type of a national pride, a different type of liberal reading of the national tradition, which is a way to integrate some of our countries within the European Union and not making this nationalism basically destructive and being anti-EU in their nature. So probably this is going to be the task of the new kind of a political parties that are 
for him to come after this illiberal turning center in Eastern Europe. And you can see quite a lot of it. Uh, and I do believe that you can see a major, uh, major uh, things like this in places like Poland, uh, where the idea of the defense of constitutional uh, tribunal, the idea of the defense of uh, the independence of the courts was very strongly argued as being part of the constitutional tradition of Poland. It was uh, the expression of the Polish patriotism is that we are people who know the importance of independent courts, and this is why we are standing against the government uh, that is trying to sell uh, this type of majoritarianism as a Polish tradition. Um, what's the responsibility of the EU in this, and or of, of the West of the EU? Uh, Judy Dempsey recently wrote, the EU should not be surprised by your skepticism or disappointment with the EU, and I would add, with the illiberal turn. She said, I quote, blame the EU's lack of backbone in speaking out against corruption and degradation of the rule of law and media freedom, which are now increasingly common in several member states. So is there a co-responsibility by the European Union in, you know, being too reluctant to or maybe too late in reacting to some of the developments which have been so, so evident? Uh, th th this is an interesting question. And of course, it's uh, easy to criticize the European Union for what it didn't do. I, I very much agree with you that a certain moment was lost. But at the same time, for the European institutions, but also for the Western countries, it was quite important not to be viewed as somebody lecturing the East. So on one level, you are not going to tolerate certain type of decisions, but on the other side, you don't want to treat them in the way teacher is treating students, because this can also backfire. And in order to show the complexity of this, I'm reminded of an opinion poll of probably two years ago, when there was the major debate about uh, European uh, uh, decisions with respect to the constitutional tribunal and the constitutional changes that uh, the Polish government was trying to promote. Here is the paradox on the question, do you believe, do you support the changes proposed by the Polish government, which basically were constraining and politicizing the constitutional tribunal in Poland? The majority of the polls said no. The second question, do you believe that European Union should be the one to press Poland on this? The majority of the polls said no. So this tension between the decision of Brussels to show to the Central and East European countries that it respects their political sovereignty, it respects basically uh, the vote uh, of, their, uh, of uh, their citizens, and on the other side to show that there are certain red lines and that the European Union cannot be a union in which authoritarian or semi-authoritarian states uh, belong. This is a contradiction that is very strong and you do not have a general answer. It's very important to find the right moment and basically to find the right policy to respond. And the strongest moment is when you know that Brussels also speak on behalf of the public majority in this country. This was why, for example, Brussels were much more outspoken about Poland than about Hungary. Now this is changing because the Hungarian opposition is becoming stronger. Because basically you see the mayor select Budapest. But this is the strength of the opposition. The fact that you're not simply imposing European norms from outside, but you're part of a majority that is not represented by the government, in my view, is very important for these policies. When it comes to corruption, this is also critically important. And this is the institutional trap of the EU. Listen, in the European Union, every country basically on many issues has a veto. So, you know. Micro, please. Yes. Hello. In order not to allow some of these governments to veto policies, which are so important for the EU, Brussels all the time is making compromises. You remember very well that Hungary and Poland were almost threatened that they are going uh, to veto the recovery fund. 
if uh, there are going to be a much stronger connection between the rule of law conditionality and the spending of the money. But I do believe that the European Union was not doing enough going up the well-known concrete cases of misuse of European money. And what now Americans, for example, did in Bulgaria with the global Magnitsky uh, and others shows that obviously there was the way for the European Union to be much more kind of strong in its response to these tendencies, at the same time having the majority of Okay, but EU is evidently not strong enough to prevent Bulgaria from being the spoiler in uh, the southeastern enlargement process because now the unilateralism by Bulgaria makes or st virtually stop the enlargement process. Northern Macedonia has changed its state name because of EU conditionality, because of uh, Greece's um, uh, pressures. This used to be a condition. Now the condition is ful fulfilled and we see Bulgaria step and say, okay, Macedonians should uh, now change their history interpretation <laughs> and um, other things. And what did the European Commission? Nothing, it seems to accept. So where's actually the red line for the EU? is that in a certain way the red line this I can't hear you yeah I said the red line disappeared in the sand because uh, this is so much kind of a trying to prevent this not to allow that I agree with you there was one of the major commitments to all of the countries who are joining the European Union is that when they are in they are not trying to use their membership in the European Union to solve problems with neighbors. Uh, and this was very strongly, by the way, implied when these countries were joining NATO. And now, obviously, it failed in the case of uh, uh, Bulgaria and Macedonia, and it took a long time for Greece, basically, uh, 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 to change its position when it came to the name of Macedonia. So the reason is that when you are with, within the European Union, when you are part of the club, you have a lot of incentives to use it to promote certain interests and you know that you're not going to pay a very high price for this uh, because loyalty of the other members goes very much to the club members. Uh, and this makes European Union look very weak from outside. This is absolutely true. Uh, how this is going to change? Listen, I do believe that there's going to be a growing pressure uh, for some of these problems to be solved, but also part of the crisis uh, and I don't believe that the Bulgarian government for a long time can keep the position it's uh, doing. I don't believe it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is, what is also interesting is that European Union in general is not signaling, particularly to the countries in the periphery who are not in the European Union now, that it really cares. It was amazing to see during the pandemic that uh, European Union member states didn't find 20 or 40,000 uh, uh, basically vaccines to be given to Northern Macedonia, at least to protect uh, their medical workers. And this was done by uh, uh, Vucic Serbia. So inward looking nature of the European politics in the time of crisis is very much in my view, remaking the relations between the union and its periphery. Thank you. The upcoming EU presidency is Slovenian and it's led by a declared admirer of Donald Trump. His name is Janis Janša. So what do you expect under Slovenian presidency to happen? Listen, small countries can make strange things, but of course, and of course the, the non-paper that obviously was uh, sent by the Slovenian government, or at least uh, there is a rumors that have been sent by the Slovenian government uh, about redrawing uh, the borders in the Balkans is one of the way what you can expect. But one of the things is that because of the pandemic, because of the recovery fund, because of the fact that now the public is so much focused on getting back to a certain level of normality, I don't believe that uh, Slovenian government is very much in a position to try to push for an agenda that is different than European mainstream. 
So probably the Slovenian prime minister will be unable to use uh, the EU presidency in the way he would have preferred. We got another question from the chat, which brings us back to Hungary and the university system. And the question is what the chances are for the younger generation to restructure the university system in Hungary. This is interesting because what we are seeing in Hungary with the university system is really a big issue. Imagine that if this kind of a policy succeeds in very short period of time, Hungarian universities are going to be governed by a foundation which has stuffed very much with the loyalists of the current government. And the fear of the university is, is of course, goes much more to what many of these basically uh, uh, leaders in Poland, in Hungary, genuinely fear. Uh, and uh, this is a type of a uh, sort of progressivism that particularly come from the American universities. The idea that what they see in the United States when it comes to the identity politics can come back to their country is very much explaining these extremely radical uh, policies with respect, uh, to, uh, with respect to universities. Also in the case of Poland, you have the creation of a particularly special conservative universities where you expect uh, to basically just educate the future leaders of the, uh, of the conservative parties. Uh, and this uh, comes with the fact that also Catholic Church, particularly in Poland, is very much worried by the fact that the decline of the young people who go regularly to the church has dramatically dropped in Poland for the last decade. So the fight for the soul of the youth is going to be critical, and the place where this fight is going to take uh, place, of course, are the universities. So if during the Cold War, the trade unions was the most important political place because everybody was asking the questions where the loyalty of the workers will go, is it going to stay with the Soviets, is it going to stay with the Western societies, I do believe that now the universities are very much replacing the trade unions as the place where the major political and cultural clashes of the next decade are going to take place. Good. There is a question to you and myself, namely, are um, to compare the situation in East Central Europe with the Balkans, are there the same sources and forces of a liberal politics in the Balkans than those in Central and Eastern um, Europe? I would uh, start with a, the observation that from the Western Balkans, even more people have already emigrated as um, they are actually 25% of the total population already present in uh, the European Union. Um, and secondly, that uh, Actually, all of the Western Balkan countries are not homogeneous countries. They are still very much uh, ethnically mixed. Northern Macedonia has a 25% population uh, of Albanian. Um, Serbia has like 15%. Uh, Bosnia is totally mixed. So the situation is quite different. And yet the question stands uh, even whether there are comparable developments and uh, explanations. For instance, when we look at what happens in Serbia, Vucic, whom you already mentioned today. No, listen, there was a, an Albanian colleague of mine who had in my view the best uh, description of the transition in uh, uh, many of the Western Balkan countries. And his uh, uh, a summary of the process was uh, Western Balkans moved from repressive to depressive regimes. Uh, and demography is extremely important for understanding what is happening in the Western Balkans. None of these countries is a member of the European Union, so the economic development is totally incomparable to places like Poland or the Czech Republic uh, or the Baltic states where regardless of any type of a negative things that we talk about, people are living better. Secondly, at the same time, the opening of the borders allowed for a very major exodus of people, 
And the demographic trends are really, really uh, 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 depressive because the, the predictions are of the demographers that in the next 30 years, Bulgaria is going to lose 38% of its population, but Serbia is going to lose 28% of its population. Uh, basically, uh, while Austria is going to gain 16% more people than in 1989. I'm comparing with 1989. So this loss of people, this loss of young people, this aging uh, uh, societies in a moment in which the welfare system is in crisis, is making the situation in the Balkan much more dramatic. And being outside of the European Union, uh, suddenly something important happened, and Mr. Vucic is a great demonstration of this. Before, uh, uh, and you know it uh, uh, better than me, being part of uh, uh, the policy, uh, 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 the policy work in the Balkans after the Yugoslav Wars, the idea was that we know what is going to happen in the Balkans. They're going to join the EU. What we don't know is when. Suddenly, this is not clear anymore. The understanding is that if the current way of voting in the European Union exists, these countries, of course, can start negotiations, but when they're going to come is a very distant future. And this, at the same time, the economic, the political, the cultural presence of other powers, China economically, but also Russia, Turkey, uh, has been very much visible. So what you see in the case of Serbia is very much going back to the model which was well known uh, for Titus Yugoslavia, uh, during the Cold War. In a certain way, these countries are trying to get relevance uh, by using contestation of the outside powers. They are not interested anymore to make a strong commitments, for example, to the European Union. Part of the idea for any type of economic development is basically playing with different uh, big powers and trying to push them to compete for their loyalty, which also means that by this, they are going to limit the possibility for outside powers to criticize them. Of course, it's different from place to place, and this strategy is not the same everywhere. Uh, but particularly the success of uh, uh, President Vucic when it comes to the vaccination, as you know, he was vaccinated with, I don't remember which of the vaccines. His prime minister has been with Chinese. His probably defense minister with the Russian vaccine. This idea of the multi-vector diplomacies by a small countries in a world which is not as much EU-centric as it was, is a new game in the Balkans. And it could be a very dangerous game for a society which anyway lack a lot of social cohesion. And my last point on this is when we're talking about the post-1989 period, traditionally it is perceived from Warsaw, from Budapest, from Prague. And everybody believed that what we saw in the ex-Yugoslavia was a deviation, something coming from the past. And this is fair to admit that many of the problems that you see in the modern world, but also many of the clashes that you have in Europe today, you could have seen in Yugoslavia of the 1990s. So this strange story and this strange fear of the people in these societies that probably their problems are not coming from the past, but from the future, is something that also we should keep in our minds. Thank you for saying this. Um, I was about to quote uh, Serbian historian Dubravka Stojanovic, who observed in an article that she felt uh, reminded of the 1980s in Serbia when she looks at current uh, European and, uh, and US politics. She referred to Trump. Um, so what she said is uh, that the Yugoslav case, or the developed starting in Serbia, but the Yugoslav case was, main, was possibly the start of a new era of nationalism and populism. As you said, we used to interpret uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia as something backward, uh, something anachronistic. But what if it was actually not anachronistic, but a kind of forerunner for developments um, in Europe? So shouldn't we then reinterpret our history of democratization, Europeanization, totally? Uh, no, no, listen, very much. And we should remember, because from this point of view, the fact that we marginalize the Yugoslav experience as something as if outside of history of uh, Europe of today, in my view, was an intellectual mistake of ours. 
uh, because uh, looking basically what Yugoslavia demonstrated first the strengths of the ethnic identity and all this drive for ethnically homogeneous states. Uh, the famous uh, uh, slogan, why me to be a minority in your country when you can be minority of mine, uh, is something that we can see very much in different parts of the world. This, by the way, obsession with demography that I was talking about. Probably remember very well the obsession of uh, the Serbs' political and intellectual leadership with the difference in the birth rates in Kosovo in the 1980s. So all these problems, and also the idea of power, uh, that power should not be constrained. Yes, people can uh, vote. They're going to elect their leader, and then the leader has the right to do everything he believes is good for his country. And in a certain way, there are democracies in which you can have elections, but basically you don't have a functioning propositions. All these is things that are coming back. Okay. And now it is really interesting enough to try to... Okay to reinterpret what we are seeing very much in the key of what we have learned or not learned out of the Yugoslav experience. A question from the audience brings us back to Orban and his associates um, in uh, several countries, namely in Slovenia and maybe in Serbia. So the question is whether there is the risk of an he or she says, a liberal, a liberal front in Europe or an illiberal access in Europe upcoming? This is a very important question because uh, Mr. Orban always had a European agenda. For example, uh, the Fidesz government is uh, regularly doing opinion polls in 12 different European countries, including every three months, including... Uh, uh, including all the Western Balkan countries. So in a certain way, particularly after the elections of President Trump, uh, both for Mr. Orban, but for many other people, including the current Slovenian leadership, the idea was that history has turned its direction, that this is their time. And this is quite important that many of these people still believe that what you're seeing in the United States is unsustainable, that basically uh, either President Trump or somebody minded like President Trump is coming. You can imagine what is going to be the impact if Mrs. Le Pen is going to win the elections in France. So from this point of view, uh, there is a strong political will to create a common France because also creating common France is critically important for the very survival of these regimes. Why I said that European Union lost the momentum. When uh, Donald Tusk was the prime minister of uh, uh, Poland, you could have isolated Viktor Orban in 2010 or 2011. Now the Hungarian and the Polish government are basically backing each other, and each of them is not allowing the punishment and the isolation of the other one. And of course, you're going, if you're going to have three, four more like this, then the process of uh, functioning of the European politics is going to change dramatically. Uh, so yes, I see an attempt to create uh, uh, illiberal alliances, there is also very much kind of a media support uh, and uh, uh, kind of creating platforms. Uh, and also nothing succeeds like success. The very fact that Mr. Orban is staying in power for now uh, 12, uh, 11 years uh, makes his model very attractive for others. But when we talk about who is the real model for these countries, and I just want to make this for two minutes, I never believe that either uh, President Putin or President Trump is what basically these uh, prime ministers and leaders really admire. It was very much Mr. Netanyahu that was really the leader. And it was a leader because, in a strange way, Israel became uh, the embodiment of the dream of the interwar European nationalists. You know, positive and negative term. Positively, you have a country that is extremely successful in its economic development, high technology, that really managed to transform itself for a very short period of time. This is also the only Western country that managed to reverse the demographic trend. Also, this is a country which is extremely powerful in military terms, extremely influential in international politics, but also this is a democracy that very much insists that the state belongs to a certain ethnic group. And I do believe this is the model 
for all these leaders. And it is not by accident that uh, some of the electoral advisors to Mr. Orban have been hired and they have been working for many of the liberal leaders in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, with the exception of Poland, by the way. But Mr. Orban, Mr. Vucic, they have been using these, uh, these advisors and this understanding of politics as constant fragmentation and polarization in where basically you can shift policies, but you always want to keep society totally polarized. Thank you, Ivan, for answering all these questions and sharing your analysis with us. This was an extremely interesting and uh, stimulating discuss discussion. Um, I would like uh, to continue uh, discussing with you for um, hours, but our time is up. And uh, so let me thank very warmly. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers and um, the technical staff to make this happen. And of course, to our audience, which listened and asked questions. I guess there are some more which we could not um, present to you, but maybe next time, and I would be very glad to continue the debate in an, on another occasion very soon. So keep well in uh, Vienna or Sofia, wherever you are. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience, and sorry for the bad connection, but it was this good. is the reality. Thank you. Bye-bye.